going to talk a little bit here with some three of the most prominent and successful Greek Americans uh, in the world of uh, public service and giving back. It's an honor for me to be here with them. Um, and I caught some of the wonderful uh, uh, proposals that you all have put together and was uh, extremely impressed uh, and uh, very, very impressed with both Leon and Bill for putting on this contest for public service, which seems unique to me. I don't know where that happens elsewhere in America. But uh, I don't want to put a damper on Bill and, and Leon's enthusiasm, but I have to say that they were not, they were not the first to come up with this idea. Um, it was the ancient Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in ancient times, when the, there was need for, say, the building of warships, the Greek, uh, uh, the, 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 there would be a call out would go to the citizens of Athens or the cities of the city states uh, for a contest. Who could build a ship and get it to the port of Piraeus fully equipped most quickly? And so the wealthiest and most successful citizens of, of the city state would go out and pull together teams of, of, of carpenters and rope makers and sail makers, and they worked like dogs for the honor. They got no money for this, they got a little crown. But uh, in doing so, that's how the, 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 the Greeks managed to pull their citizens together. And these wealthy gentlemen, and they were all men at that time, unfortunately, um, had to go mix with all kinds of common people and build these teams, and they became the mentors for younger people to uh, see how these successful men made it and how they organized things, how they worked in the, in the political system, and so, uh, Leon and Bill, you've, uh, you're holding up a noble tradition. So, congratulations. Um, we've all had mentors. I know I had mine. Um, I'll just tell a very quick story. My first mentor was my father, who had a little ad agency in St. Louis, kind of a one-man shop, and uh, and we did uh, uh, commercials for car dealers and restaurants. And my job, other than just selling the stuff, was to write the commercials. And he could write a commercial in 20 minutes. But it would take me all day, and I'd go in, and he'd carve it up and edit it and say, go back and do it again. And that's how I learned to write. And uh, uh, I think it, it, it helped me in my career as becoming a journalist. My other mentor was Charlie Peters, the founding editor of the Washington Monthly. And uh, when I got an internship at the Washington Monthly, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Um, I'd imagined the writers for this magazine to be uh, guys my age with salt and pepper hair who have been around and I walked in and they're all in their mid to late twenties, just a couple years older than I was. And I thought, my God, if, if they can do it, I can do it. And I think that's the nature of, of these challenges. <laughs> you probably didn't need this microphone. My voice tends to carry, my mom says. Um, <laughs> so we've all had mentors. We've all had people who've inspired us. And so I want to begin uh, with my with these three these three uh, uh, prominent Greek Americans and and ask um, and I, I'm going to start with um, my friend and former colleague Sylvia Matthews uh, uh, Sylvia I know that you've had any number of mentors but tell us a story who was a mentor and how did that person help you. Well, I have, and I think as as you stated that the mentoring sort of began at home. Uh, with my parents and the example they set, especially with this issue of giving back. And whether it was uh, every organization that had a representation of an animal, the Lions Club, the, the Elks Club, uh, my father was a Shriner, my mother was president of the church women for 25 years. And so for me, in terms of the space of giving back, I learned so much in my home every day and we're up coming up on Halloween, and I remember in my household, you could not trick-or-treat for candy until you trick-or-treated for UNICEF to help other children who didn't have anything when you were out getting your 
next round for the candy. So I think for me that mentoring started at home and then has continued through so many wonderful people who have given me their time, their energy, and their knowledge, whether it's been Michael Dukakis when I worked on the, since I've worked on the Dukakis campaign many, many years ago uh, in 88 and was a governor's aide even before then, or Robert Rubin, who was Secretary of the Treasury, who even to this day, I recently made a career transition, and Bob was an incredible help, asked me the right questions in terms of the things I should think about. And so I've been very fortunate, or Patty Stonecipher, another mentor who was the CEO of the Gates Foundation, where I used to work, who continues to be a person that I go to and speak with and get counsel. So started in the home, and then expanded from there. Kathy Elsis, um, you, uh People know that you were successful in business and then moved to philanthropy and did have done extraordinary things. But I also know that you also had an early uh, experience in politics uh, and an early experience with mentoring. Tell us about that. Uh, well, first, I was very impressed with the young men and women who presented, and um, I, was, I was kind of blown away with how articulate everyone was and passionate. Um, you obviously weren't minted well enough, though, because you didn't ask for enough money. <laughs> <laughs> and I know the judges will have a, a very tough time in awarding the prize. And uh, but I think you all should be financed. And so whatever doesn't get done, I will personally fund to get everyone. <laughs> that you all had uh, big aspirations but modest economic requests and that's what we look for in entrepreneurs by the way um, so good for you um, my um, heavy mentoring started uh, in Lowell Massachusetts and I, I didn't get to work for Paul Sangas as he was running for Congress and that led me to working um, on the Hill, and that's why I frankly applied and was accepted at Georgetown University. And so that moment in time where some people would look and say, you know, why are you like going to Greek picnics and canvassing door to door? Um, I looked at it, if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have ended up at Georgetown, I wouldn't have ended up in DC, I wouldn't have, um, met my next mentor, who was Father Durkin, who was a professor at Georgetown University. And uh, that 48-month experience of working on that campaign and my time at Georgetown really changed my life and put me on the course that, that I'm on. And it, it had signaled to me how important mentoring is. And frankly, in this part of my life and career, mostly as an investor, uh, in companies and backing young people, that's what I see my, my major motivation is, um, trying to create double bottom line businesses, um, businesses that do well by doing good and building enterprises that I'm proud of. John Sarbanes, no one uh, uh, has a more uh, uh, greater claim to having a father as a mentor than you. Uh, we all know and love your father, um, and I know, as I said, my, my father was my first mentor. Um, we want to hear about, about, about being led in your thinking by your father, but we also want to know who else was a mentor. Well, first of all, let me congratulate the uh, students that are participating in this contest, not just the five finalists, but the 18 teams that came together across the country, um, and I also want to thank apparently the 50,000 people that have participated in voting online uh, in, this, in this competition, because it shows that, that young Greek Americans across the country are engaged, and we're extremely proud, as Ted said, of the commitment that you're making. I can't offer to fund anything, because I'm <laughs> part of the federal government, and we have a huge deficit right now. <laughs> However, there are programs in, in government, things like the AmeriCorps program, which actually were modeled after uh, nonprofit uh, 
organizations that did good work. So you never know where your your efforts to give back will lead in terms of the, the support that can come both from the private sector and philanthropy uh, and from the public uh, sector. So, of course, my father was a model uh, for me, uh, a kind of quiet model. I mean, he, I learned by his example, really, watching how he committed 40 years to public service in a kind of no questions asked fashion. I think that that came from his own upbringing. Uh, I didn't know my grandfather because he passed away before I was born, but my grandmother, um, in her own way, was someone who gave back every single day, and I think embodied this idea of filotimon, which we know literally means love of honor, but I think embodies the notion of living and living an honorable life, which includes giving back and serving others. There's two, there's two other folks, though, that I would talk about. One um, I had direct contact with, and that was a fellow named Gary Bellows, who was the head of the Legal Services Clinic at Harvard Law School when I was a student there. And he set up a clinic in Jamaica Plain um, uh, in the Boston area. And um, he was absolutely undeterred in his efforts to help people who are underrepresented. And I had the honor to be able to work in that clinic for two years and to see up close and personal the nature of his commitment. And I think that was a, a real motivation for me. The other is someone I never met, and most of us never met, but were inspired by, and that was Martin Luther King. And I'm very proud of the fact that Archbishop Jacobus marched with Dr. King in Alabama uh, during the Civil Rights era did it as a, a testament to the <coughs> church's commitment to freedom and democracy and justice. Um, and I have long been uh, inspired by Dr. King. In fact, uh, when I was in college and law school on, on Dr. King's birthday each year, I would, I would find a library that had uh, audio tapes of Dr. King's speeches, and I would spend the day, that day off, uh, listening to those speeches. And, and thinking about whether I'd ever have the opportunity to connect some of his visions and my own uh, commitment and career, and uh, I feel that, that I have that opportunity. You know, we have different pack portions in our lives when we feel that we can give back more than at other times. Um, there are times when we have to be focused on what we're doing and, and we're proud about ourselves and about our ambitions. There are other times when we've got a little bit more, uh, a little bit more time, resources, and we can focus outwards. And there's times when we're very busy, but we have the ability to do do things because of where we are. Um, uh, Sylvia, uh, you've managed uh, in the foundation in your foundation work to combine a career, a wonderful career, an important career, with leverage. Right to do amazing things, um, and in, in a sense, it's the perfect place to give back. Tell us just a little bit about what you're able to do with the position that you have now and, and had at Gates, um, and how how because of where you've come from and, and what you've achieved, you're able to leverage that for the greater. Well, I feel incredibly fortunate to have had the opportunity to both work in government, in private philanthropy, and now for a corporation, both in philanthropy and I work in the business in terms of trying to use the business as a means by which we can have social impact, a little bit of what Ted was saying um, about how to think about it. And in terms of one's ability to do that, I've been, as you said, very lucky that I get to get up every day and that's what I do um, as part of my career, is this idea of giving back. And in my current position, which I've only had now for nine months, I uh, just came here in January, part of why I came to Walmart is because I believe that the scope and scale of an entity that, that, that is this large, when it lines up against social impact and it uses its skills, its assets to change things that it really can. And the example I'll give is in food. So Walmart's the largest, the world's largest grocer. And so what we want to do is make sure people have affordable, accessible, healthy, sustainable food. And so we use the power of the business, 
and then the power of philanthropy to do that. And that's where I, for me, that's why I'm excited to be here. So with regard to affordable, Walmart is a place that believes in everyday low price, and we have tried and made a commitment to save people a billion dollars on fresh fruits and vegetables so that they can have, that connects to the healthier point. So affordable and accessible, we're trying to go into places where there are food deserts. Um, we also are labeling product that is healthier. So when people go in the store, there's a simple label. But not everybody knows how to use that. So philanthropically, what we're doing is we are taking education components and going to communities to educate about how to do that. And then finally, we fund many, many food banks and we use our excess food. So coming to a place like this in terms of one's ability to have that kind of impact, that's why I came and that's why I'm hopeful I can continue to do and work on food and other issues here. Ted, I, I know that what Sylvia talked about is, is what you've done a lot of. Uh, uh, you talked about a double bottom line. Um, tell us a little more about that and, and, and give us an example or two of, of how it works, how you can invest for both uh, sustainable economic profit as well as common good. Um, well, I'm really struck by the, the Greek synergy going on here. Um, <laughs> the, the very first thing I ever did in media was I wrote an article for the Hellenic Chronicle. It was an interview with your dad. And I was just thinking about that. That was my first uh, <coughs> endeavor for Peter Agnes, who owned the Hellenic Chronicle. And uh, Sylvia, we've never met, uh, but I'll, I'll give you an example of a double bottom line business. Um, I founded a company in venture capitalized and served as chairman called Revolution Money. And um, it was a company that was aimed at creating a offline and online um, credit business it was like a PayPal meets MasterCard without a high fee. So I thought that the banking business needed some reform and that you could use the internet to disintermediate a lot of high fees. And so I, 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 oh, we just lost her. And so we created this company. So we created a company, and um, and it did well, and I sold it to American Express, uh, and the company um, the company did well enough that now I'm on the board of American Express, and last week it launched a big joint venture with Walmart. <laughs> And it's powering all of the banking inside of Walmart. And so um, what Sylvia was saying about Walmart trying to embrace what's called the unbanked. Um, so Sylvia, so you probably missed all of that. <laughs> so you missed all of that, but. I did. I just, I can't see you, but I can just now hear you. I said I started a company that um, was trying to help the unbanked and sold it to American Express. I'm on the board of American Express. And last week we did the big deal with Walmart called Bluebird. Bluebird. <laughs> and so that, that's just one example of trying to do well and doing good. Um, another example I'll give you two is a, a local fund that we created called VPP Venture Philanthropy Partners, which is set up to help social entrepreneurs and we treat social entrepreneurs like you are a founder of a company and we we administer this fund first fund was 50 million dollars uh, second fund i think is 65 million dollars where we embrace young entrepreneurs who want to start sustainable ongoing businesses and not only will we give you seed capital and help you to write your plan but we'll give you the capacity building dollars and then VPP goes out to its limited partners, its LPs like me and Peter Barris and, and if we like what we see, because we know there's discipline, 
they leverage that investment by going to our foundations. And then the, the third thing I'll, I'll talk about very quickly is that um, there are many currencies now available for young people to tap into outside of the traditional time and money. Um, you have a lot of capability and power because pixels have become a currency. Your ability to use the new media and social media to activate change is really, really important. Um, I've started a company called Snag Films. Snag Films is a, a destination now where there are films and movies and shorts that fall under the umbrella of a, a, a term I made up called film entropy. <laughs> movies that want to make a difference, they're good news films, they, they activate charitable giving, they activate change, and there was no place for these films to be distributed. And in each of these films, we hook up with a charity. And so over the years, I, I created this company. We now have 4,000 films in the database. You can watch the film, and then if you like it, you can snag it and put it into your Facebook feed or embed it into your blog. Uh, since we launched, we now have 400,000 virtual theaters. We've reached more than 4 billion pages. We're now streaming literally tens of millions of movies per month. Comcast became an investor in the company. Steve and Gene Case are investors in the company. Terry Semmel, who was head of, of Yahoo and also head of Warner Brothers. And it's being called the, the Netflix of documentary film and independent film. Um, it was totally started under the assumption that we could do good work, that people would donate their pixels and distribute these good words. Uh, we support more than 400 charities. Uh, when you go to Snack Films, you'll see each of the filmmakers has picked a charity that he wants to have one click against it. And so it's a, it's a business I'm very proud of. It's having great social impact, but all of a sudden it's turned into a real business. It's building great value, and one day we'll either go public or be acquired. I'll take the winnings, if you will, from that investment on the largest shareholder and put that back into my foundation and then use that to support more charity. So I think that virtuous cycle is what we're all looking for, but what powers it is people donating their pieces of real estate on their pages and pixels. So I encourage you all to go to snagfilms.com. Don't please God do what a cousin did and go to stagfilms.com. <laughs> <laughs> snagfilms.com. <laughs> um, I bet you my father used to be a great admirer of Lee Iacocca. And he'd say of Lee Iacocca versus himself in his little tiny business, he said, you know, I'm the same as Lee Iacocca, just move your decimal. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I'm sitting next to this, this phenomenally successful uh, entrepreneur and, and businessman, so I'm just going to move the decimal point over and say that, that at the Washington Monthly, we uh, had the idea of doing an alternate college guide to U.S. News and World Report, which was a much bigger publication. We didn't like the way that U.S. News rated colleges based on selectivity and money and prestige. And we created a different measure of greatness for colleges. We measured them on whether they recruit and graduate low-income students and whether they uh, encourage public service on the part of their students and ROTC and Peace Corps and AmeriCorps. Anyway, long story short, we are uh, uh, we put a lot of pressure on the. the the rankings have kind of gotten a lot of attention, and we're beginning to put a lot of pressure on colleges to change the way they think about, about, uh, about what they want to be, who they want to serve, and what they want to encourage. And uh, 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 it hadn't cost a lot of money, 
but it's uh, what I can do in my little in my little uh, little little magazine. Um, John, you're you've got uh, a piece of a much larger enterprise, and that's the federal government. Um, tell us some things that you've done that you've been able to to, to do in government that encourage public service and and giving back. Well, before I do that, I just want to um, reinforce what, uh, what Ted just said, because I think he made an incredibly important point, which is oftentimes, and, and young people fall victim to this, they think that they sort of have to pursue their, as it were, their main career, their career of enterprise and, and self-advancement, and then once they achieve a certain standing, then they can kind of turn their attention to uh, giving back or philanthropy or whatever it is. But the point I think Ted is making, and he's making it at a much larger level, but you can apply it in your own, in your own life, is that there's no point in your development when it doesn't make sense to give back because it will actually help to make you more engaged in the community and opportunities that benefit your main career, as it were, your vocation, will present themselves because you took the time to give back. Um, so there is that virtuous um, connection that, that Ted talked about, and you can find it in whatever you're doing, um, in whatever community you're, you're active uh, with. Now, you know, I've been in Congress for six years, and I came with this notion of wanting to um, leverage the resources of government um, in a way that helps to spur people to give back and commit uh, to public service. There's a couple things that I've focused on. Uh, one was to look at uh, an opportunity for students who graduate from college or uh, professional school with significant debt burden to have that burden relieved if they pursue a career in public service. So in my first term, I introduced legislation which we call the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Act. And basically, what it says is that if a young person who has um, debt from federal loans or federally consolidated loans uh, wants to go into public service, and this can be government service or nonprofit service, and they agree to commit 10 years to that, then during the 10 year period, their monthly loan repayments will be significantly reduced based on an income uh, to debt ratio that they have. Um, and at the end of 10 years, whatever they still owe, whatever the balance still owed on that loan is, will be forgiven based on their commitment to public service. And I did that because I saw so many young people who wanted to continue on in public service or begin a career in public service and didn't see how they could do it uh, given all of the financial pressures they were on and the debt burden that they carried. So this is an opportunity now for people not to have to put their dreams aside if they had this dream of going into uh, public service uh, because they'll, they'll, in, they'll have this opportunity for some, for some debt relief. The other thing, and I mentioned at the outset, is my focus on the AmeriCorps program. Because this is a wonderful opportunity for young people to get involved serving the nation. And I, I took an interest I had in the issues facing our veterans, and I connected it to the AmeriCorps program by authoring a provision that is now law to create something called VetCorps. So this is a dedicated focus within AmeriCorps for service opportunities for returning veterans and military families where they can serve others and where they can be served by people in the community. Um, and it's opened up a whole new set of opportunities um, for our veterans. So I think, as I mentioned before, there's ways for government to partner uh, with the private sector, with the nonprofit sector, and with the volunteer, the individual volunteer out there to make a difference in communities across the country. And I don't think that the full potential of any community is realized um, without that kind of combined enterprise. And I also don't believe that the full potential of any individual can be realized um, if they don't in some way commit themselves to giving back. I mean, the way I, I think of this is I think there's, 
You know, you can maybe realize 95% of your potential just by focusing on sort of your individual achievement. But that last 5% is reserved for people who give back to the broader community. And so you can't pretend to have fully realized your potential unless you've found a way to give back, which is exactly what the students here are doing. I would also say it's a good career move. Um, Sylvia's done pretty well. <laughs> um, the gentleman who's CEO of Snag Films ran the AmeriCorps program. Uh, his name is Rick Allen. Uh, he came with the Clinton uh, staff. Um, I have a private equity fund and a venture capital fund called Revolution Growth, and the gentleman who's our chief counsel and runs it is Ron Klain, who was Biden and Gore's chief of staff. And so you're, you're able to move in and out. And I, what I see now is this blending of social responsibility. And um, when we were growing up, um, we were advocates for change. Uh, we, we just felt in the 60s and the 70s that things were broken and it was our time. And now I see for young adults, there's never been a greater time to take control. Um, you have more tools for change in the palm of your hands. And giving back and building your own networks and your own karetsus and your own point of view, even while you're in college. Um, one of the things that I've tried to do is make charities, help fund charities that use the online medium that allow you to time shift in an easy way. A couple of examples would be eBuddies. Um, I, I helped Anthony Shriver, who was a Georgetown student, launch Best Buddies, which is a mentoring program between um, you and an individual who suffers from an affliction, mental retardation, and, and it's a way to mentor. I, I email every single day, and I've done so now for 15 years. One of my best friends lives in Tampa, he's almost four years old now, and he's Big Ken Holden. And it certainly changed my view of a community, and it's elevated his life, and we honestly are best friends. Um, on the scholarship side, um, the Gates Foundation, um, I'm on the board and very active in the DC College Success Program and DC CAP, where I serve on both boards, and but I mentor, and you. I have a young man who, um, you know, Ward 7 in the city, um, who needed help. Never met his father, uh, no one in the family had gone to college, and all he needed was that help to be able to prepare to get into college, and then mentoring to stay in the college. And there are scholarship programs that take care of everything. That's the amazing thing. You see the output if you can help them to get into school and to stay in the school because the financial side of things are taken care of by these great philanthropists and great organizations. And so there are these online programs where you literally mentor people on a daily basis and meet with them to help. And so so I don't think, you know, as John said, you have to wait. You can get involved right now, and you'll see immediate payback and in income. But on a long-term basis, I think you'll be a part of the positive change that our economy and our country needs.